What is it about an island? What is it that captures our imagination? Maybe it's that islands are a world apart. Oceanic outposts where native communities have evolved in isolation for thousands of years. Every plant and animal, an integral part of a unique, self-sustaining ecosystem. What's surprising is just how vulnerable islands can be, how easily certain human activities can disturb this natural environment, and how a chain of seemingly unrelated events can undermine an ecosystem that has sustained life in balance for thousands of years. Rising up from the Pacific, like a strand of floating fortresses, the Channel Islands beckon us to their rugged shores. Of the five islands that make up Channel Islands National Park, Santa Cruz Island is the largest of these wild refuges. Only 25 miles from the mainland, a visit to Santa Cruz is like taking a step back in time to what California was like 150 years ago. Oases of biodiversity, Santa Cruz and the other islands are home to plants and animals found nowhere else on Earth. Like the Galapagos Islands of South America, the Channel Islands provide a rare opportunity for species to evolve in isolation. Over 150 species are unique to the Channel Islands, and 13 are found only on Santa Cruz Island. The island also harbors other treasures, including some of the world's most well-preserved and sacred cultural sites, which shed light on the lives of the island Chumash, Native Americans who thrived and lived sustainably on the island for thousands of years. The island's plants and animals also flourished for thousands of years. But in the mid-1800s, pigs and sheep were introduced by European settlers and eventually formed large feral populations, numbering in the tens of thousands. The presence of non-native pigs and sheep on the island had a tremendous impact on the island's vegetation. You have to remember there were literally thousands of these animals roaming the island. And through grazing and rooting, they created bare soil. And it was in these areas that the invasive plant species, the non-native species like fennel and the annual grasses, invaded and were able to outcompete the, the native plant species. It was a result of these impacts that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service listed nine of the island's plant species as endangered or threatened. The archaeological remains of the Chumash Islanders also fell prey to the non-native animals. The non-native pigs impacted the archaeological sites in many ways, but especially through rooting down for foods. This rooting on average extended about one to two feet in depth, which is not very deep, except when you consider that a lot of these sites do not extend more than three to four feet in depth. So that resulted in about 50% of the site being impacted. What was being lost to us as native peoples with the destruction of the non-native animals, especially the pigs, was the sanctity of our sacred sites, the disruption and disturbance of our burials and the artifacts out on the island. It was very unsettling for us. In the 1950s, the island was struck by another blow, this one from offshore. Bald eagles were once a very important part of the Santa Cruz Island ecosystem. We believe there was at least seven nesting pairs on Santa Cruz. Bald eagles were heavily impacted by the chemical DDT. DDT was manufactured in Southern California. It was discharged into the marine environment. It affected the entire food chain, eventually working its way up to bald eagles. Bald eagles, as a result, laid thin eggs. The eggs were crushed and these birds weren't able to reproduce. The end result was bald eagles were totally eliminated from the Channel Islands by the mid-1900s. This set the stage for a new inhabitant to colonize Santa Cruz Island. Golden eagles ventured over from the mainland, lured by the promise of easy prey. Unlike bald eagles who feed on marine animals, golden eagles hunt terrestrial animals. So with the bald eagles gone, the golden eagles were able to move onto the island. 
They took advantage of this non-native animal, the feral pigs, that were existing on Santa Cruz Island, and they also hit the island foxes. Island foxes weren't accustomed to having an aerial predator, and they never saw the golden eagle coming. Island foxes, a unique species found only on the Channel Islands, have long been the island's top predator, living without the threat of being hunted by other animals. But now, for the first time, the foxes had become prey, and the results were catastrophic. Island foxes on Santa Cruz Island declined over 90% due to golden eagle predation between 1994, when we estimated there were about 1,500 foxes on the island, and 2000, by which time there were less than 100 left, and the population was in dire straits, almost at the verge of extinction. For the island foxes, the bald eagles, and many other species, life on Santa Cruz Island had become unsustainable. There was little chance of the island recovering on its own. So the island's managing partners, the National Park Service and the Nature Conservancy, put together a multifaceted restoration plan built on science and long-term commitment. One of the biggest threats is losing unique species found here and nowhere else in the world. The balance of life had been so deeply disturbed for decades that the island was simply not going to be able to right itself on its own. It was clear that if we didn't take immediate action, the island's unique natural systems would collapse. A plan to restore the island's species and ecosystem was put into action signaling a change from an era of island ranching to one of conservation and preservation of a national park. Island restoration efforts began in the early 1980s with a program to remove the non-native sheep. It was a first step towards turning the tides and restoring the island ecosystem. Historically, there were over 100,000 sheep on Santa Cruz. When the National Park Service acquired the eastern portion of Santa Cruz Island, we began to round up the sheep they were moved into corrals and then onto boats and brought here to the mainland. After the non-native sheep were removed, the island was granted some reprieve, a chance for vegetation to regenerate, for the landscape to stabilize. But non-native pigs continued to wreak havoc on the island's cultural and biological resources, ruining sacred archaeological sites, uprooting native island vegetation, and supporting golden eagles that, in turn, would eat the island foxes. Island foxes were brought into captivity on Santa Cruz Island, as they were on San Miguel and on Santa Rosa, because they were on the verge of extinction. Their populations were so small, and the threat of golden eagles was still so high, that captivity was the only thing that was going to save them at that point. In 2002, 10 pairs of Santa Cruz Island foxes were brought into captivity to serve as the core or the nucleus of a captive breeding program that would eventually attempt to repopulate the island with island foxes. Captive breeding of island foxes had never been attempted when we started it on Santa Cruz Island in 2002, and we were faced with a number of challenges. First of all, we had to get the right foxes into captivity. Luckily, there were radio collared foxes out there in the wild and we knew who was mated to whom, so we were able to bring in mated pairs. Now for the foxes that we brought in that we wanted to mate with other animals, we actually studied their genetics to make sure that we weren't mating them with relatives. Uh, we also needed to come up with a proper diet for island foxes, and for that we worked with the National Zoo. Uh, we needed to come up with the right type of enclosure uh, to keep island foxes in because of their uh, prodigious climbing abilities. Uh, and finally, we needed to come up with an operational plan that would take us uh, well on the road towards recovery of the wild population by gradually releasing foxes from captivity over a number of years, since the whole idea was to recover the population in the wild to a viable level. But the captive-bred island foxes would have little chance of surviving in the wild if the golden eagles remained. In order to recover island foxes, we decided it was necessary to live capture and remove golden eagles. The most successful technique that we used was the bow net. The bow net was put in the ground and hidden. We put a lure or bait in the center to attract a golden eagle. If a bird came to the net, we could remotely trigger it, safely capture a golden eagle, and we could bring it to the mainland and release it in Northern California. By 2006, 44 golden eagles had been relocated to mainland California. 
But this relocation didn't guarantee the safety of the island foxes. New golden eagles would continue to be sustained on the island until the non-native pigs, their main source of food, were removed. As long as feral pigs continued to roam the island, the ecosystem would remain in jeopardy. The daunting task of removing the non-native pigs was handled by a team of experts from New Zealand with a long history of eradication projects focused on non-native and invasive species. In order to efficiently cover the island's 96 square miles, the island was divided into five zones separated by fences. When we completed the first zone, zone one, we could actually leave that zone and walk away from it knowing that it's complete and prevent immigration from the other zones that bounded that. And so that was a really, really important aspect of the, of the project. Without those, it meant that instead of having 8,000 acres to protect once you've completed it, we would have had 96 square miles of area to hunt continuously. So the, the, from that aspect, the fences were really, really important. Even with the zoning, there was still a vast amount of terrain to cover, a task that could have taken a decade if the team had been earthbound. Yeah, the helicopter was by far the most important tool in the, in the eradication process. It, it allowed us to take at least 75% of the pigs off the island very quickly and very efficiently and cause the population to drop almost overnight. By 2006, the last of the over 5,000 non-native pigs had been removed from the island. With the removal of the pigs, the golden eagles could no longer be sustained, opening the gates for the reintroduction of bald eagles on Santa Cruz Island. We thought the time was finally right for reintroducing bald eagles to the Northern Channel Islands. In 2002, the Institute for Wildlife Studies established a partnership with the National Park Service to reestablish bald eagles on the uh, California Channel Islands. Between 2002 and 2007, we released over 60 bald eagle chicks on the islands. This is about an eight week old bald eagle chick. It was hatched out at the San Francisco Zoo the zoo's been a cooperator in this whole program to bring bald eagles back to the Channel Islands, and they have a captive colony of bald eagles there that they use to produce offspring like this for reintroduction programs. Okay. Once the birds reach about 12 weeks of age, this is the time when they would normally start flying in the wild. And they're jumping up and, up and down inside the platform and exercising their wings and actually hovering a little bit inside the space they have there. We know at that point, it's time that they can be released. Early in the morning before it's light, we lower down uh, the, what we call the fledging door that allows them their first glimpse in the new world outside the cage. And they go out on that and sometimes the birds are not too quick to take their first flight. It's a pretty scary uh, event for them. Other birds, they get outside and they take off almost immediately. And what we do prior to releasing them is place a radio transmitter on the birds and that allows us to track their movements after they leave the platform. So we can make sure that they're doing okay no matter where they go. By 2006, the multifaceted restoration plan had begun to show results. For the first time in over 50 years, a bald eagle chick successfully hatched on Santa Cruz Island. Eagles will typically be, begin to breed when they're four to six years of age. And this has actually now happened on Santa Cruz Island. Our, in, in 2006, we had our first successful breeding of eagles that we released there. A bird from uh, Santa Catalina Island that was released paired up with one of our Santa Cruz Island releases, established a nest, and successfully raised a chick. We currently have two breeding pairs, adult breeding pairs on the island, but we strongly suspect that in the next couple years that number is gonna increase because more of the birds are maturing and starting to pair up. Bald eagles are among the many symbols of success in the endeavor to restore the balance of life on the island. By all measures, the captive breeding program on Santa Cruz Island has been a remarkable success. In just five years, almost 100 pups were born in captivity and almost 100 foxes were released to the wild. And these releases, combined with the removal of golden eagles, have almost assured 
Island Fox Recovery on Santa Cruz Island, making this one of the most successful and quickest recovery programs in the history of endangered species. As for the island's native plants, signs of recovery are sprouting across the island. On the coastal terraces, we're seeing recovery of native plants like giant Coreopsis, Toyon, California sagebrush, and uh, island buckwheat. And the recovery of these plants is reforming the island sagebrush community, which was once more widespread on the island prior to grazing. What's really amazing is the recovery of the native plants here in the riparian area. When I first started at the park 10 years ago, none of these plants were here. And now look, many of them are over my head. But the island's plants and animals aren't the only beneficiaries of the restored ecosystem. With the removal of the non-native animals, and especially the pigs, we can see the restoration of the island and the protection of our sacred sites while the native plants are growing and covering and stabilizing the land. We see the preservation of our culture in terms of its physical presence, but we can also know that for future generations, our children will be able to go and see the islands in a natural way and hold on to and keep the stories of our ancestors. Although the signs are hopeful, how do we know if this restoration effort on Santa Cruz Island has been successful? At the National Park Service, we measure the success of our efforts on how close we come to restoring the naturally functioning ecosystem of Santa Cruz Island by br bringing back bald eagles, island foxes, and protecting the rare plants and animals, some of which occur nowhere else in the world. We can ensure that in the future, Santa Cruz Island is self-sustaining and requires minimum human inputs. One of the biggest lessons that we can learn from the restoration of Santa Cruz Island is the power of nature to be able to heal itself if given a chance. The collaborative restoration effort on Santa Cruz has yielded unprecedented results, but challenges still lie ahead. Santa Cruz Island is still vulnerable. We have to remain vigilant. The island fox, the bald eagle, and the landscape itself are still recovering. By establishing Santa Cruz as a national park, the island and its inhabitants now have the promise of stewardship, a promise to preserve the delicate balance of life here, now and for generations to come. So what is it about islands? What is it about Santa Cruz Island that captures our hearts? Perhaps it's that places like this remind us of wild places that we have lost and how important it is to protect the wild places that remain.